usually we're going to know if we're going to be a threatened area many times three to five days ahead of time. If it looks like the storm track and intensity is going to continue towards this county where there's an indication that we're going to have to do evacuations, this county has a history of before the storm announcing that it's a good probability we may have mandatory evacuations and we're encouraging people to do voluntary evacuations even before we have to get to that window where the mandatories come out. That's how we let people know that if you're going to go this is your time to get a head start. The other thing that usually happens is as we approach uh, as it gets closer and there's going to be uh, some high probability we're going to be impacted we began to increase the number of public broadcasts we do. Channel 27, 91.9, all those things are giving out information. Even the printed media helps us with that information. And once we, often, when we get down to we're locked in at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., we do briefings. Why do we choose 10 a.m. and 4 p.m.? The reason for that is, is if we make announcements at 10 a.m., the media markets help us get it out during the lunch hour. We do it at 4 p.m. and it allows us to help us get that information out at the after hour, after work hour news. And uh, we can have, we often have more than that, but at least 10 and 4. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, one of the questions that we were hoping to cover, um, and I'll go back to raising hands in the audience, if one of you could describe the process for um, after a storm when a disaster is evaluated and to what level and to what extent then that FEMA or state or federal, the, the whole process of what clicks to turn things on? Uh, that's a good question because it, it gets complex um, it, and it's not, um, the way it's designed is in the Stafford Act. It's very clear in, in, federal, in federal law of uh, what it takes to be declared for a uh, disaster declaration by the president. Uh, first of all, I try to remind people that it has nothing to do with getting help. Uh, local government uh, and volunteer organizations are going to help help you anyway. Um, the first line of defense for, for businesses and homeowners is always insurance. And so that's important to be insured, um, to have flood insurance, and have those documents with you. But let's take, it to, let's take it to the next level, that you don't have insurance or you're underinsured. You've lost your business, you've lost your property, and uh, what it takes to get federal assistance. That's the big question everybody's asking, Congressman. And the way it is... Um, not only today, but I'm going to give you some thresholds. First of all, there's public assistance, which is, um, and then there's individual assistance. I'm going to start with public assistance, which has nothing to do with the public. It has to do with public infrastructures. Uh, for you to get um, disaster declaration dollars, meaning federal dollars, into your community for public assistance, you have to reach a threshold for the disaster. And it's based on um, the census of that state and the uh, and right now it's about 18 million with a threshold of uh, three dollars and eleven cents per person, which means that disaster has to equal 20.9 million dollars. If it does not equal 20.9 million dollars worth of disaster destructed areas have been assessed by the state and federal government, you cannot receive a federal declaration. If you do, then, and these are counties and, and, and municipalities that are struggling today due to the economic climate um, that need to rebuild these road, roads and infrastructure. Um, the second part of this is that county, based on its population, has to meet a specific threshold. I'll just give an example. Um, I would just, you know, unless you know it off the top of your head, probably the uh, threshold for this county alone is probably, I would say $150,000 to $500,000. So this specific county would have to, above and beyond the $20 million threshold, have to have enough damage specific to this county. Because remember, most of these disasters affect multiple counties. And each county has to meet its own population threshold. That's for businesses and, 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 and uh, specifically county and state infrastructure. Individual assistance, there is no threshold. If the disaster exceeds the local state capabilities to manage that disaster and there is assistance that's provided, enough damaged homes, unfortunately loss of life, uh, significant devastation, the president has tremendous discretion to declare that disaster for individual assistance. And when individual assistance comes, FEMA 
brings a tremendous amount of resources to, resources to provide temporary housing, rebuilding those homes. Um, but on, generally, if you look at the last probably 25 years, there's got to be about 100 homes, and it's not, ri not written anywhere, about 100 homes that are damaged or destroyed in that community for you to get individual assistance. So that's how the federal government comes to place to provide federal aid to that community. And that federal aid by the Stafford Act is a 75% federal reimbursement to the state and locals, a 25% cost share, which means the state will cover through the legislature and the governor's office 12.5%, but that means the local government has to cover 12.5% of that cost. So it is confusing. It's complex. You have people in leadership at your local level and the state level who will be on the ground to help you through that process. More importantly, you, don't, you should never wait on a piece of paper from the president, the governor, or local officials to get assistance. If you need assistance, get assistance in your local community because um, it should be provided regardless if you declare it or not. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, this is probably for John. What's the general procedure after a hurricane of when you can go out, um, check your business? Um, is there a certain period of time? Or is there, because uh, we've had this in the past after a hurricane, that you see some people on the road, you're told to stay off the road, and what the general procedure is. That's a good question, and actually it's more of an event by event uh, policy. Generally speaking, though, it's been our experience that most of our storms come in the middle of the night. And uh, we often have a lot of power lines down and those, those types of things. And we encourage people not to go outside or travel off your property until the wind speeds get below about 40 miles an hour. It's just not safe out there. In fact, when the wind speeds get to above more than 50 miles an hour, we start to pull law enforcement and fire rescue vehicles off the road as well. Hopefully, everybody has listened to our warnings. They've evacuated to safe areas. and. Uh, People are, people everywhere want to go out and see what's happened to their house. And uh, we, I think somebody mentioned earlier, if you're going to go outside your house, the simplest things is make sure you have shoes on. We have more people step on nails, cut themselves with saws, and those kinds of things because they're trying to rush out there and get a lot of things done. And then people are trying to call their boss to see if we're supposed to go to work today, not go to work today. The Emergency Operations Center works very, very diligently trying to work with employers, particularly the larger employers in town. And our broadcasts, we're telling people schools are going to be closed tomorrow. Government buildings are going to be closed tomorrow. The, the biggest employers are open or closed for business. We try to get the information out. We also know that a lot of people just want to go look at the beach and see how much damage there was. Or we have people that want to go certain areas. And we encourage people that not to do that. People are trying to run the emergencies. When a major storm comes through, the first thing we're trying to do within the first 24 hours is we're trying to go out and we're trying to do search and rescue and try to find those people who something bad has happened to to take care of them. It's very difficult to do that if you're working in an area and somebody sees red lights and sirens going to an area and everybody wants to go see what happens. It's just difficult. Uh, along this same line, in 2004, you were probably here in 2004, you may remember that whatever traffic signals that Francis didn't take down, Gene did. And so we had a curfew that was established just because there were so many intersections in this community that there was no electricity, and if there was electricity coming back, there was no signals. And so it was a curfew. And that was to keep people at home, not driving at night and not having accidents because we didn't have enough people to support all the intersections for traffic control. And I would tell you, if you went back and looked at the stats, there was about a three-week period there, two-and-a-half-week period, where we had less vehicle accidents and less motor fatalities than we have ever in the history of this county. And it's because people were being very cautious. I know, and everyone knows, that we want to go out and check on things. We have to go to our businesses. And all I'm saying is it probably should be during daylight hours and just use caution and be reasonable. If, if the power is off, most businesses aren't going to be open. I think Ruben said it very clearly is that when the schools open, people can go back to, go back to work. I would suggest to you, I've worked in a number of other counties that had disasters, and I don't know if there's an empirical fact here because it's not, but Historically, when you reach about 70% electrical restoration, the community comes back to life. Until that point, schools aren't open, the sandwich shops aren't open, the restaurants aren't open, and, and uh, we recognize that. 
And that's why on the restoration side of the community, most of the businesses that are along US 1, State Road 60 in the South County, County Road 512 in the North County, there's a number of restaurants, there's a number of uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, those types of businesses, when we're putting the power back in this community, we encourage the municipal power companies to support those areas first. As soon as there's people that aren't going to have food, if I can get the grocery stores up and going, then people can buy groceries. Many of the schools run. I'm getting a little long-winded here, but there is a restoration plan, and a lot of it has to do with electric electrical restoration. Um, um, and before we go to that question, um, if we could just do a quick tick down, and, and Congressman, if you want to do that, and John, um, if you want to weigh in, um, what an emergency kit for your home, just the bare necessities. You know, when we talk about hunkering down, what those recommend recommendations are that people could go out and buy today to make sure they have on hand? You want me to start first? Sure. I would suggest to you, go to the website. If you don't have a website, a oh, computer at your home, take one of these books. In this book, it tells you how to create a kit. Many people are on a budget, and so it could be very expensive to go buy everything all at one time. And so there's a multi-week uh, plan in here about how to get those kinds of food things that you need to take care of you and your family, everything down to a manual can opener. We had people call in 2004 say, I have all these canned goods, and I have an electrical can opener, and the power's off. What should I do? And so it's, it's very simple, but we tell people it's like going camping, and you need to plan for three to five days. Everything you take on a camping outing for three to five days, that's what you need to have at your house so you can survive. And we have a little checkoff list. We have a little checkoff list also on the materials we have in the lobby, Catherine. Well, so. this, is a, this was a mailer that went out to everybody. So how about you read it off? because we don't have extras outside, but it was mailed to constituents. Yeah, they, they may have been tired of hearing this stuff, but, you know, you have to have a plan shared with your neighbors, an out-of-state family, a gallon of water per person for at least three days, three-day supply uh, or more of non-perishable food, two-week supply of prescription medicines, battery-powered radio, and no weather, weather radio with tone alert and extra batteries, flashlight and extra batteries, first aid kit, and your personal information package. If I could jump in there, the form that I did bring breaks it down very nicely to just what the minimum is, and then it kind of reminds you of the needs of the individual family members. I mean, the minimums that you might want to keep in, like your things that were mentioned, but then you may have smaller children that you may need to make sure that you've got things for them as well, as well as additional medical things. This breaks it, you know, this particular sheet breaks it down very well, very, very well as far as the getting a kit. And then you have all the steps of a plan and the things that you need to do. There's also some websites on here that give you the ability to go on the web and print out little cards to keep all your emergency information to keep on, as well as a safe and well website that you can register your family members on so that your family out of state can find out, as well as all the steps to follow. It's, it's kind of a really concise and there is, I'm sure there's enough out there for everyone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. An ounce of prevention is worth the pound, pound of cure. We were talking about electrical failures. Is there any coordination at the state or at the county or even at our city level to try and improve the uh, integrity, the soundness, the vulnerability of our electric system. I notice Route 20, um, Route 60, 20th Street, Osceola Boulevard to the old timers, is being rebuilt. The first thing the boys did in rebuilding Osceola Boulevard was to move the old telephone poles several feet to the side. And the telephone poles are terrible. They're going to blow down in a good wind. I don't understand why there wasn't an attempt to at least bury those lines when 60, Route 60 was being revised. I can appreciate that we can't have all of our lines underground, but it seems to me there ought to be more of a concerted, coordinated effort to do a better electric system for our counties and throughout the state of Florida. Is there any 
aspect of government that's working on that. Let me speak to at the local level. And within the county emergency operations center, we do have a representative from FPL who is one of our providers and also the city of Vero Beach is represented at the EOC. I would suggest to you that they're, they're doing much better the, uh, than we were 15 years ago. There's been a great deal of effort to try to improve the integrity of the polls. There's been some discussion about buried lines and some of the new newer areas are, do have buried lines. I would suggest that uh, on the FPL side, and I don't have any stock in FPL, but you can go to their, you can go to their website, it's fpl.com, and you can look in your neighborhood. They, you can find the last time they trimmed the trees in your area. You can find, a, a, they're doing a lot to try to preposition some of their resources closer than some of the problems we had in 2004. For those of you that don't know, FPL did not have a stockyard in this county, but north and south of us, the counties had, they had pole yards and supplies. They did not have one in this county, so they're having to transport things back and forth. Since that time, FPL has increased their presence in this community. I know that, uh, I know some folks over at the Vero Beach uh, Municipal Power Plant, and I know they made some aggressive steps to improve their services after a storm too. Uh, and it's not just, it's not the people, it's the infrastructure they're working with. They've made some major improvements in, in their system. In the real world, when the wind speeds get above about 90 miles an hour, there's gonna be failures. It's just gonna happen. But I think there's a, a very, uh, there's a very good strategy to try to bring that power up as quickly as possible. I'm coming. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for um, doing this today. I appreciate it. Um, but my question, uh, from a knowledge point of view, um, a lot of what we're talking about is uh, reactionary after an event occurs. Um, I'm interested in the anticipatory planning and, 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 and coordination so that you know, as we see, you know, first, you know, a hurricane go to flash to bang in, in days, you know, very quickly. So what governmental processes are in place that facilitates the prepositioning of logistics, you know, in, in, in that uh, avenue? And likewise, from a legislative point of view, what success has been achieved in, I know there was a effort to have gas stations with power generation capability, et cetera. And, you know, there's a whole host of things, but from a, from a citizen's point of view, I'd be curious to know what success has come about from all of the lessons learned from previous storms to anticipate and then prior to the onset of a hurricane, the citizens knowing that, okay, if the, you know, infernal poop hits the fan, we've got it's kind of like what you said. We've got some um, electric generation folks that have put poles in, or maybe on a state perspective, we know that the National Guard has been alerted. So if, if, if it goes over 90 miles an hour, we've got this going on. So just a question. Let me share with you a couple of lessons learned from the 0405 hurricane season then. Uh, first of all, um, it, it's it's our role jointly, and I, and I say this for not only myself but the 67 county emergency management directors that uh, we gotta practice how we're going to play. And we just conducted the greatest, largest exercise in the in this in the, in the state um, with regards to a hurricane. We replicated the Great Miami Hurricane in 1926. It's a storm that if it hit today, it actually. Um, comes in as a category four, almost category five in the Dade Broward area, exits Hillsborough County, Tampa St. Pete, and then hits the panhandle. That storm today, if it actually did happen today, like it happened 26, would be three times the devastation of Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, a hundred, over $160 billion storm. And uh, why do we have to practice for that? Because we want to look at the worst examples and see what gaps the state has. There's going to be a lot of gaps to local, state, and federal level. Um, we've identified a couple of them. For a storm of that nature, there's not enough urban search and rescue teams in this country to provide the necessary search and rescue that has to happen in the first 72 hours. Let me share one important lesson, a couple of them, I'm going to share with you from the 045 hurricane season. First of all, um, shelters. 
Guess where we're putting a lot of people in these communities that have to evacuate? First of all, Florida doesn't evacuate like New Orleans or Mississippi. They leave the state. It's too long. It's limited roads. Even though if we reverse lane, it's quite dangerous. We tell people just go inland, literally tens of miles. Get away from storm surge. That's what kills people. But guess what? We're putting Aunt Betty and uh, Grandma Wilma in a shelter. When? In August, September. They're 86 years of age. Guess what? It, 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 there's a little electrical power light that says exit. That, that works. But this is 100% humidity in South Florida and throughout the state. And it's uh, 90 to 100 degrees. Not a very safe environment. Because of that, both this legislature and the governor um, implemented a, uh, a special needs shelter generator project. I'm not sure if there's one in this specific community, but there's 60 across the state that now have generators. When I say generators, this is not your Home Depot generator. This is a two kilowatt generator valued each one of them on the average over a million dollars to two million dollars. The installation is, in itself is over a million dollars. This powers the entire school. And so um, we've learned that sometimes you just can't get back in community. If you're going to have people with special needs um, before, during, or after disaster, you got to have them in a safe environment. No other state in this union has done that. And now we have 60, 60 places across the state um, that have this in place. A second one, fuel. You're right on it. I will tell you that. Um, I just talked to the, the, the Department of Environmental Protection and the uh, Florida uh, Petroleum Council literally yesterday to talk about fuel status and capaci capacity in this state. There's a lot of spot market buying that occurs, but our goal and responsibility is to have enough fuel in the state um, in our tankers. But the second part about it is how are we going to get refueled and how are we going to get that fuel to those gas stations? Why? Because people want to run generators. People need to get to work. You know, in Hurricane Wilma, when I was in Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department, oversaw the 911 center, we could not get dispatchers to work in the 911 center because they were running out of fuel. Now, extrapolate that to nurses and doctors and, and people who are running nuclear power plants across the state. So it is critical. That being said, the legislature has passed law that requires uh, gas stations, and I, uh, I'm not going to quote the law, but that if you're on a major um, uh, thoroughfare, specifically uh, state interstate highways, that within so many miles of that facility, if you are open, if you're open, you have to have um, uh, the ability to have power to pump fuel. So you can't have your fuels off and selling Diet Cokes. If you're going to be open, you're going to pump fuel, and that means you have to have a generator there installed or have the capabilities to have a generator brought in in a plan to be able to be plugged and played. So there's a lot of lessons learned. Guess what? There's going to be a lot more. And I think uh, through the experience that the state has been through, we're constantly learning through, um, I wouldn't say mistakes, but ways to improve our ability to uh, respond and recover from a disaster. Um, my, my question is uh, kind of follow-up on business. I manufacture a, uh, a hurricane safety light, very inexpensive, small light. That uh, Where would I register? Uh, you know, I, I hate to think that at the last minute I've got a warehouse of thousands of lights that are very small, just crank lights, that waterproof. Where would I put, you know, uh, on an internet site or, you know, how do I make available to uh, any kind of entity that would need emergency lighting, you know, f for uh, general public to use with no power? I heard business. My ears perked up. This is a, a, a an emergency device, correct? Lighting, emergency lighting device. Am I correct? Yes. It, it there's uh, well there's uh, procurement. There's, there's probably uh, procurement classes or, or workshops that we offer that would uh, identify public dollars specifically for that type of item, that type of product. But let me ask: Are you warehousing this at a single location? Multiple locations. Okay, good. And, and the, what, uh, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here because one of the problems that I've identified in recent years that really isn't addressed much in the literature and the practice 
of, of uh, business preparation is alternative suppliers and alternative locations for storing inventory. The, uh, back to your specific question though, a good starting place would be the, the uh, uh, statewide and federal uh, online, the, there's ways of researching those. Uh, well, I, I would start with Lowe's. I would start with the major retailer, and then I would work your way through the industrial, or let me say the, the trade associations that focus on that type of product. Are you a member of a trade association? Yeah. 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 I, I, and and the, the, I'm mentioning trade associations because that tends to be a great area for business to identify other similar companies with similar attributes and uh, purchase insurance or, re or have other companies with similar capacity. Uh, if I may, a quick, uh, during Tropical Storm Faye in Volusia County, I was on site during a, uh, an area that was devastated, flooded out, and it was a, a local print shop, and family owned, and they were out of business. The, the family was there, and they were out of business, flooded out. My question to them was, who do you have that you outsource to? Who else can, can, can do this type of work across town? And, and there was no answer. And I, I, the print industry is perhaps the best known for identifying that type of outsourcing or partnership. And, but the uh, trade associations would be an ideal way to find, uh, to find additional capacity and, uh, as well as additional buyers for that type of product. Excuse me, just two questions. You made mention that channel 27 is a county government channel for cable. That's is there, correct. Is there a light cable for direct TV or direct ch a channel? I do not think there's a direct channel for that, no. That's, that's why I mentioned we're also going to be giving information on 91.9 .9 as a primary radio, which will be simulcasting what we're talking about on the cable channel. Okay, so if we have direct TV, we do not get the information. I'm not aware of any connection with direct TV at this point. And the second question, I don't, I don't know the current status of 60 West, but in the event of evacuation, will it be cleared up and made available? I would tell you, anybody that's been out on State Road 60 West, it's uh, once you get past a couple miles past 95, it's fairly agricultural lands out there. When the road was a two-lane road up until just a couple of years ago, it was quite common that we'd have flooding out there that would shut that road down. One of the difficulties we had on the emergency services, if somebody had a vehicle accident out there, we had a hard time getting to the accident with traffic backed up for several miles. In recent last two years, if you've been out there, at least to uh, Yeehaw Junction, it's a four-lane highway, a divided highway. It's much better. The road elevation is much higher. One of the things we also do is we also have people in the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, that's a state road. The, we have the law enforcement community assist in telling us when that road is going like it's going to have a problem, and we'll discourage people to use that road. Again, if you're going to use State Road 60, it's an easy way to get to the Turnpike or to even to the West Coast. If you're going to use that road, leave early, well ahead of everybody else. It'll be a very busy, and there's choke points. Yaw Junction is a major choke point. John, I think he's talking about the construction that's happening between here and 95, aren't you? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking beyond. No. I was west of where you're at. Well, there is road construction going on. And um, what usually happens is that when we do get to a point where that track and intensity of the storm is a pretty good likelihood that it's going to impact our, our area, the contractors, the road contractors start to pick up their barriers and start to, uh, th those things that are out there are going to be blown into the travel way. Those have to be picked up and secured. Uh, at least for the remainder of this year, it's a good probability that's going to be a very awkward area. And we're just hoping for the best. Um, one bit of information we were hoping that the FEMA folks could cover, and I don't know if anybody on the panel can address this, is um, flood insurance. Um, are either of you aware of the, the key website to go to or information to find out more, to find out if you qualify um, to be required to? I don't know if you can. Uh, I think one of the uh, key things for flood insurance is there's a minimum required time before a storm actually comes, and, I, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, it's either 60 or 90 days. It's pretty far in advance, and so 
um, uh, we need to urge people to get flood insurance. And there's a process to do that. Look, all you got to do is, is Google FEMA flood insurance, and you'll find it pretty quickly or use what other search engines you, engines you want to use. But it's important you have flood insurance because if you don't have flood insurance, most of the damage that we have seen I is not wind-related. It's always flood. And if you don't have flood insurance, um, you may lose your home. So make sure you have flood insurance. And if you do, make sure you have that policy with you wherever you go. It, it goes a long way to laminate things. And, and for those here, I know I don't have the information in front of me, but if you do call um, Congressman Posey's office, we, we do have that information and can help point you in the right direction. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, the regular insurance for the home, I don't believe they will issue within 36 hours of a, a Florida landfall. So if, if folks are not insured for windstorm, uh, they can't wait until the storm is approaching to go get it because... I can't get it. Great. Any other questions? Okay, Congressman. Well, I want to uh, say thank you again to the uh, friendly Indian River County Commission, the individual commissioners, and, and the management of this great county. I want to thank our panelists, John and, and Scott and Doris and Reuben and Robert, uh, and I want to thank you for taking the personal responsibility to come here to make yourselves uh, better prepared to be a be a survivor of the, of the next disaster. Uh, God bless you and God bless America.